Author Tony Early first introduced us to Jim Glass, the precocious 10-year-old from Aliceville, North Carolina, and the critically acclaimed Jim the Boy. Now Jim is back in Tony Early's second book on Jim Glass in Aliceville, The Blue Star. I caught up with Tony at the Arkansas Literary Festival. We have that interview and a panel discussion on this episode of On the Same Page. We're at the Arkansas Literary Festival in Little Rock, and we are interviewing Tony Early, the author of Jim the Boy and The Blue Star, as well as a collection of short stories called Here We Are in Paradise and a nonfiction collection called Somehow Form a Family, stories that are mostly true, which is a great title. Uh, but mostly we're talking about The Blue Star, which is his latest uh, sequel to Jim the Boy. Tony, thanks for joining us today. I appreciate it. I'm glad to be here. Before we get started with the, with the books, uh, I want you, if you could, just tell us a little bit about your, your background, yourself, where you're from, and, and how you started as a writer. I'm from a small town in western North Carolina, and I've wanted to be a writer since I was in the second grade. It's the only ambition I've ever really had, so I'm, I'm glad that it worked out. And now you're at, uh, where are you living now, and what are you doing? I live in Nashville, and I teach creative writing at Vanderbilt. And in your spare time, you, you write novels. Is my, that right? In my spare time, I write novels. <laughs> the Blue Star, uh, we pick up with Jim Glass, uh, the character of Jim the Boy. He's now a teenager. He was 10 in the first book. He's now 17. Right. Set in uh, World War II, uh, as the emergence of World War II, right. 1940s, in a small town in, in North Carolina called Aliceville. Uh, why did you uh, go back to, to Jim and... and and how was that to, to pick up on him again after a few years? Well, after Jim the Boy came out, I really didn't want to go back to Aliceville. I really didn't want to write any more about Jim. And so I started something that was, I hope was going to be very postmodern and very smart and, and hip, but didn't work out. And so eventually I decided, well, I'm go back to Aliceville and, and see, what, see what happens. I've sabotaged my career long <laughs> enough. Was it easy enough to get back to the character? It was like I'd, it was like I'd never left, really. Right. Once I decided that it was okay to go back to Aliceville, and um, it came much more easily than I thought it would. Because uh, Jim the Boy came out in 2000, correct? Right. So we've got an eight-year gap, exactly the, the the gap in the age of the, of the young man. Yeah, well, I guess easily is a relative term because I apparently do write extremely slowly. And when I started The Blue Star, I didn't know I'd be writing it in real time, so he's he's 10 in the first one, he's 17 in the second, it took me about seven years to write it, so. What do you mean by writing in real time? I, I wrote it apparently at exactly the same pace that he was living it. Yeah. I read The Blue Star first, I did it backwards, read The Blue Star, then went back and read Jim the Boy, and found that that's fine for a reader. Uh, you wrote these as standalone books, even though they are the same characters, is that correct? Right, I think, you know, ideally that, they would be read in order, but each does stand on its own. Yeah. At least I hope it does. Uh, I said I called this a sequel, but you're probably going to write, revisit these characters down the line. Is that right? Do you I'm, have plans for more? I'm, I'm starting the third one any day now. But not yet. Well, I got to wait till school's out. <laughs> um, where does Jim Glass uh, come from? Is he partly you? Is he someone you knew? Is he someone you wished you were? Well, there's. I honestly don't think there's any th such thing as pure imagination. Every fictional character comes from what a writer knows about the world and knows about people. And so there are elements of my personality in, in Jim, probably many that I'm not even aware of, but certainly very little that happens to him has happened to me. Uh, Jim the Boy was, was set in, in the Depression. Right. This one, we're on the cusp of World War II, just before Pearl Harbor. Uh, when I read the books, it, it felt as if it was a book written in that era, not just about that era. Uh, it, it just had a, a, a feel to it, a sound to it, a tenor to it. Um, how did you How do you go back and get that? Uh, did it come naturally, or did you, you know? Well, I don't know about natural, but it's, it is certainly intentional, and I'm trying to take some of the conventions of 
of literature from that area, era and children's literature from that area and, and write a book that's obviously coming out in, in contemporary times. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, I, I think they're, they're a little odd and that, that, that sort of that oddness is, is what I was you know, trying to go for. Uh, you've called this a, in, in another interview, a children's book uh, written for adults. Right. What, what do you mean by that? Well, I, I took sort of the, the classic children's literature toolbox and tried to use those tools mm -hmm. and not use any from sort of the more contemporary American fiction toolbox. I mean, it's, it's completely unironic and um, very, very simple language, very simple yeah. sentences. And I tried to use those tools to tell a complicated story. I've, I've, I've heard that you said that when you, you write in, in simply like that or with simple um, uh, storyline, that, that the machinery of advancing a story is tough to do because you have nowhere to, to hide it, I think is how you put it. Well, there's, there's a certain amount of business that has to be done in every piece of fiction as yeah. far as advancing a plot, moving a narrative along, constructing scenes. And in, with more ornate language, it's easier to hide the machinery. There's just a lot of words to hide it behind. Yeah. But with, without that more ornate language, it's, it gets a little, a little tricky, technically. Uh, the books are set in Aliceville, North Carolina. Is, right. is, that, is there such a place, or is that your uh, Yoknapatapa County? Um, Aliceville, it's a fictional place, but it does bear a striking resemblance to a small town in my home county called Ellenborough, North Carolina. Is, um, when, when, you, when you go back to Aliceville, as you did after eight years, um, how, how hard is it to recapture the place? I know you had to recapture Jim, but how hard is it to kind of go back to, to uh, Aliceville in circa 1940? Did that come back naturally, too? The place was probably the easiest part, and this sounds really, I mean, weird to say, but I, I have memories in my head of visual memories of a fictional place. Yeah. That as I write it, I can, I can see it, and I kind of can convince what I commit what I see to memory. The Blue Star is the second in a series of how many do you think? How, how often do you think you go back? I think right now I'm looking at five. And you have, these characters came from uh, uh, short stories originally, correct? Yeah. Uh, and uh, when you wrote those short stories, did you think that you would uh, revisit them later at, at book length, or uh, did you just could resist even, the character? I didn't even think I would revisit them in a short story. I wrote one 13-page short story. Yeah. And unfortunately, in that 13 pages, I did a lot of bad things to these people that I'm now stuck with, you know, almost 20 years later. Unfortunately, in the short story, I said some of these people, you know, never married and yeah. you know, never were able to the become uncles, happy. Jim, Jim's uncles. And now I think, gosh, I wish I hadn't done that. Why, can't, why couldn't I marry everybody off and let them be happy? But I'm stuck with it. Do you feel, you feel stuck to that template? You can't uh, deviate from it too much? Well, that, when it's all over, I'd like everything to, to be of a piece and for there not to be any major yeah. plot contradictions like that. Are you uh, going to pursue Jim and his, his characters, or do you see yourself writing some other... Uh, works in between some, some some more short stories or some nonfiction. Typically, what happens is that I start a book, I, a novel. I write the first section, get sort of lost, uh -huh. and write some short stories while I'm lost, and then go back to the novel. So I, I need about three more short stories for another collection. So, how long did it take you to write the Blue Star? Um, well, after I gave up on the other thing, probably five years. Tell us a little bit about your, the writing process for you. I, and I know you teach, so you don't have time every day to go to the, the computer, I imagine. But w what, what is it like for, for Tony Early to, to write a book or a, or a short story? Um, just sort of long periods of self-loathing, <laughs> fo <laughs> followed by inter intermittently by you know, short periods of typing. Kevin Brockmeyer, who we interviewed here last year, and, and I know you know, he said that when he writes, he uh, writes one sentence and will not go to the next sentence until the first one is perfect in his mind. Now, others, other writers just get down a first graph and then go back and polish and polish and polish. Where are you in that, in that realm? I'm more in the, the, the Brockmeyer school. One, I, one, one at a time, one painful a, sentence at a time? I write a sentence and then I revise it. And then I write the second sentence and then I go all the way back to the top, revise the first sentence and revise the second sentence then write the third sentence and then go all the way back to the top and come down through them again. 
What's a good day of writing for you? How many words? Um, three pages forward momentum would, would be pretty extraordinary. Uh, you also contributed to the Oxford American before you got started with Jim the Boy or Jim Glass back in the 90s, is that right? Yeah, Which, the Oxford American, we kind of started out together. Uh, we had a lot in common. I didn't have any money and they didn't either. <laughs> Uh, tell us a little bit about when you were uh, named one of Granta's big, uh, best young novelists in the United States, and I read that that kind of changed your career a little bit. Well, it, it did ultimately change my career in the long term. It sort of opened a lot of doors for me, but um, initially it made it much harder to write because they said that I was one of the best young American novelists and I had never finished a novel. Well, how did that happen? You, you, would, you would have to ask them. It really didn't make it much sense. So this was before uh, Jim the Boy came out. In every newspaper story about that list, I got my own little paragraph that pointed out that I had, in fact, never written a novel. But um, just taking that into my, into my office, I'm supposed to be one of the 20 best young American writers. And I would type a sentence and look at it and think, well, that's not one of the 20 best sentences in America. <laughs> and it was just sort of crippling for a while. But it led to, did it not lead to uh, the job at uh, Vanderbilt and to... It did. Uh, it, 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 led only to, it led only to good things. Yeah. There was a, 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 just an absolutely beautiful review of your book in uh, the New York Times Book Review. Scott Turow, the author, wrote that. And in it, he uh, posits that uh, post 9-11, that American readers are interested, sincerity is in, is how he puts it that we are interested in simple tales with good people and that your books certainly qualify. Uh, do you think he's on to something there? Do you think that's, that's accurate? You know, I really don't have any sense of that kind of big picture about what it is the, that the American public wants from a book. But I, you know, I know what I want from a book and increasingly I come to think that, that our, our fiction doesn't accurately express our world the way that it way that it is. I mm -hmm. think that in our fiction, I mean, God knows terrible things happen in the world, but I think a much higher percentage of terrible things happen in our fiction than mm -hmm. actually happens. I mean, I have to think that the vast majority of people try to do the right thing most of the time, mm -hmm. and they, they get up in the morning, and they, they go to work, and they, they do the best they can, given whatever human frailties that, that they have. And so I'm interested in, in writing about those people. I mean, t to watch television, you would think that all of us are in mortal danger from, from serial killers. Yeah. And in a bad year, how many people do you think die in America from serial killers? Yeah. But say, fifteen thousand Americans a year die from flu and more of that from car accidents. But you know, we're not we're not obsessed by that. We're talking with uh, Tony Early, who is the author of The Blue Star and Jim the Boy. And Tony, you said next is a book of uh, short stories, a collection of that, and then possibly the next installment of, of the Jim Glass saga. Is I'm, that I'm starting the next Jim Glass book, and um, when that grinds to a halt, which inevitably will, then <laughs> I'll write some more short stories. I imagine the short stories will probably be finished before the book, but we'll, we'll see. We look forward to that, and before you go, we would, uh, if you don't mind, read a section of the, of the Blue Star for us. I think I've marked Please. something here. In this passage, a minor character has come home in an unexpected way from Pearl Harbor, and Jim and his uncles have been asked to unload this boy's coffin off of the train. Up ahead, a bell began to ring lazily in the darkness. Jim heard a determined chuff of steam and then another, and the wheels of the engine began a slow, almost animate screech against the rails. As each car began to move, it pulled with a heavy clank against the coupling of the stationary car behind it dragging its brother, groaning into reluctant motion. The sound of the individual couplings clanking together galloped in succession away from the engine, car to car to car to car, growing louder as it approached Jim's position on the platform and softer as it ran away. In a second or two, it leapt into the darkness beyond the far end of the train. And then the boxcars were moving smoothly, gaining speed, bracketed by thin slashes of darkness. The brightly lit caboose, when it passed, left him alone on the end of the platform in an unexpected, expo in an exposed, unexpected quiet. As it drew abreast the man with the lantern, 
He nodded toward them and touched the rim of his cap with his index finger and stepped nimbly onto the rear step of the car. He opened the door, walked inside, and closed it behind him. Jim watched the lighted window at the doorway until it passed out of sight around the bend, and then the train was gone. Jim stood with the uncles and Pete in the starlight on the platform. When the engine whistled at the crossing east of town, it already sounded far away. That's from The Blue Star by Tony Early. Tony, thanks for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thank Great you, book. Kane. Okay, we're back with the second part of the show on the same page, the reader's panel discussion uh, for the book The Blue Star by Tony Early. We just saw the uh, interview with Tony, and um, now we're going to talk a little bit about the book. Uh, our guests today are Mary Ruth Murat, who is an assistant professor of English at the University of Central Arkansas. Thank you, Mary Ruth. And Kevin Brockmeyer of Little Rock, a uh, novelist, a short story writer. And in fact, Kevin has a new book of short stories out that I'm going to plug right now. Thank you. The View from the Seventh Layer. Uh, if you haven't read that, read it. If you haven't read The Brief History of the Dead, do that. It's one of the best books I've read in a long, long time. Uh, but let's get to The Blue Star, which is the second and I think is going to be a series of uh, stories about Jim Glass set in, um, the first one was Jim the Boy set in the Great Depression. Uh, this one's in the cusp of World War II. Um, I read a review in the New York Times by Scott Turow, also a novelist, who, who described this as a children's book for adults. And I want to start there. Kevin, do you think that's a, a fair description? And, and what do you think he's getting at when he says that? Uh, well, I mean, the language is very simple and yet very precise. And I, I think it is a fair description. If you look at the uh, epigraphs on both of the books, I think they're both taken from classics of children's literature. The first one is from Charlotte's Web by E.B. White. Um, and I forget what the epigraph in, in mm -hmm. Jim the Boy was, um, in The Blue Star was, but that mm -hmm. was the impression I got. Um, I, I would say that it, it might be more accurate to say that they're young adult novels for mm -hmm. adults rather than children's novels for adults, um, simply because the subject matter is sort of a little more mature than what you might anticipate finding in a typical children's novel. When I was reading it, it struck me as a book that I would have sought out when I was in high school and enjoyed, um, but reading as, as a 44-year-old, I, I also enjoyed it. Uh, but I also wondered if it was more of a book for, mainly for boys or boys at heart. Uh, uh, Mary Ruth, what's your take on that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that I, I enjoyed it. I think that it, it definitely um, could, would appeal to you know, younger men or just men in general, probably, which I think is, is fine. Um, but I, I think that some of the touches that he added um, could engage a female audience as well. I mean, Norma, the character Norma, who could have mm -hmm. just been a flat, kind of useless character who this we just is kind of his ex-girlfriend ex yeah. Norma um, could have just been kind of you know someone who's just tossed off, but instead she actually kind of plays a pivotal role and and he, she's a mathematician, and which I think is kind of um, a fascinating touch. Um, someone who Jim describes in the book as his best friend at the end when he actually has you know a love for someone else but mm -hmm. he describes her as his best friend she has ambitions she's she is a very kind of an interesting character who I wonder if he does do another one will kind of pursue that yeah character I, again. yeah I, should, I guess I should briefly recap Jim Glass is a 17 year old 17 or 18 now 17 I think he turns 18 toward the very end yeah. of the book. But high school senior, um, in, uh, just before Pearl Harbor and the start of World War II, and he has a crush on this girl, Chrissy Stepp, who is uh, sort of engaged to uh, a young man named Bucky Bucklaw, which is a great name, uh, who has been joined the Navy and is now stationed in Pearl Harbor. And you can kind of see where that's going. Um, Let's talk a little bit about Jim Glass, the main character, who was, who was uh, obviously the, the focus of Jim the boy. He was raised by his three uncles. His father died, I think, just before he was born. Mm -hmm. Two weeks. Uh, what you, tell, what, give me your idea of what, what makes Jim Glass tick. What's your, Kevin, what do you think of him? Uh, well, I mean, I think he's a, a rich and very... Uh, he's a rich character, and, and Tony Early depicts him very humanely. I mean, is is the main thing, you know. Uh, he 
I think what you get in the first book, Jim the Boy, is what seems to be a very authentic 10-year-old consciousness. And he follows that up in The Blue Star with a very authentic seeming 17-year-old consciousness. And if you go back to, I, I don't know whether you and Tony discussed this in the interview, mm -hmm. but there were three short stories that kind of kicked off um, this set of narratives. Um, in his first collection, Here We Are in Paradise, um, and one of them, My Father's Heart, is from the point of view of a much older Jim Glass. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me, again, to be a very authentic, rich, humane depiction of this character. Is, is it? Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying, I think it is kind of authentic of a 17-year-old boy, because we don't get every you know, kind of nuance of his thought processes, which I don't think he, he's kind of guided by impulse he's in a lot of ways. He's unnuanced at 17, I mean, yeah. He's, and I think that <clears throat> that is, you know, true to form. He's looking to his Uncle Zeno for kind of modeling how to act. You know, the scene, I love the scene where he's talking to, um, I guess it's Chrissy's mother, Nancy McBride, uh -huh. is it, or, no, Nancy mm -hmm. Step, um, and he's, um, trying to decide if he's going to have a cup of coffee and what would Uncle Zeno do, you know, in this moment. And he, so he is trying to figure out who he is mm -hmm. and he doesn't know yet. And so I think it is authentic that we don't know everything that he's thinking and he doesn't exactly know what he's thinking. Is it strictly a, a coming of age novel period or are there layers here that I'm missing? Because I thought it was a very good coming of age novel, but um, mm -hmm. uh, beyond that, I didn't see a message. Kevin? Well, I, I suppose that would be a hard, it's a hard question for me to address. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, it certainly follows, you know, what you think of as the rubric of a coming-of-age novel, and yet that wasn't how I wanted to treat it as I was reading it. I, I just felt my, I found myself treating it as, you know, a novel about a human being facing the conflicts of his own life, mm -hmm. um, you know, as almost every good novel is. It certainly engages in, you know, race and class and, you know, all of these. And, and just, you know, of course, I'm kind of drawn to, like, how he's treating these women and how Chrissy is. Yeah. You know, she just, she's Chrissy exchanged, is, you know, his, she's basically his. held captive by the Bucklaws, you know, yeah. because economically her family is tied to them or they have nowhere to go. And so she's sort of traded in a lot of ways. Um, and of course, her father, who's the Cherokee, the mm -hmm. who never Engine actually Joe. appears, and Jin Joe, mm -hmm. you know, who that's you know what sadly Jim calls him at one point and offends her, obviously. But so there's a lot of layers, I think. Um, you know, and it's unusual. It's an unusual question to address for somebody who began reading his books with those short stories, mm -hmm. because I had kind of the whole picture of Jim's life in mind. Mm -hmm before I sat down to read because Jim the those, Boy. those stories take it all the way. They right? do take I mean, it all he, the way, he, you know. He even admitted he has a template here that he's a, a, a worried about deviating from as he writes future books about Jim Glass. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, now the, the stories were first person. These are third person? I think that's yeah, right, yeah. Which is an interesting switch. And I want to talk a little bit about the prose. Uh, uh, Tony always seems to be complimented for his clear simple prose, and it's a, it's a compliment almost a backhanded way, well it's a clear simple prose for a, a children's book. Uh, but I thought it, yes it was very easy to read, but I thought he had some wonderful descriptions in here. Uh, there's one uh, section where he's describing the day before it decides what it wants to be. Uh -huh. That's just gorgeous, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and so here's to clear, simple prose. What was your uh, your take on the on the writing itself? Well, I think he's a beautiful writer, and you can tell that uh, you know he has struggled to ensure that every sentence has been locked into its perfect form. Um, and you know, in the case of these books, because they're narrated from uh, largely from the point of view of a small child, there are digressions occasionally into letters written by mm -hmm. some of the older characters in the book. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the prose has to be fairly restrained um, in what it can accomplish. But uh, I mean, I think he he tackles that beautifully, and not just in kind of the syntax of the prose, but in the rhythms of the sentences and the way they fall mm -hmm. on the page. Both the Blue Star and Jim the Boy kind of rise at the end to this sort of uh, kind of rolling fever of emotion that I found very, very moving. Is this a book that stands on its own without having read Jim the Boy? It does, yeah. yeah. I've had no trouble sort of picking up 
but definitely felt that there were ties, you know, to other stories. Uh -huh. I mean, for sure, with um, with Uncle Zeno and the you know the failed love love affair with Chrissy's mother, and kind of the possibility for that later on. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that it definitely can be read. There was referring, re referencing the uh, Scott Turow uh, review again. He mentioned that he thought that uh, post 9-11 that readers are hungry for sincerity. Sincerity's in. And um, <laughs> yeah, the, and that uh, simple tales told directly and that that might um, help this book be successful. This was written uh, obviously recently. Jim the Boy was in 2000 before 9-11. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think of that idea? Do you think post 9-11 when we want simple tales about good people, Mary Lou? Um, perhaps. Um, I think the way it sort of struck me kind of indirectly, you know, tied to that is when they were talking about December 7th. You know, it changed everything at Pearl mm -hmm. Harbor and how we kind of think in terms of that September 11th, you know, changing everything. Um, but. You know, there's a moment in the book where um, Jim is talking with Uncle Zeno, and Uncle Zeno tells him, uh, you know, Jim isn't sure he's a good boy, um, a good human being, but Uncle Zeno tells him it's a matter of deciding at every moment to be a good human being. And, you know, the, the, the second you fail to make that right decision, you're lost. Um, so I don't think it's, you know, it's not, it's not plain to me that these characters are simply good. They're trying to be. It's a compliment to the book that we've already run out of time. Ah. <laughs> it's a lot to, write, to uh, talk about. The Blue Star by Tony Early. Um, I want to thank Mary Ruth Murat uh, from the University of Central Arkansas and Kevin Brockmeyer, novelist from Little Rock, for joining us on, on the same page. Thank you for joining us, too.